Welcome to Trudge the Road. It's sponsored by Karen Treatment Centers. Karen is a nonprofit leading provider of drug and alcohol addiction treatment with treatment facilities in Pennsylvania, Florida, Texas, and offices in Bermuda, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. They can be reached by calling 1 800 854 6023, or you can go to their website, karen.org. That's C A R O N. Dot org. We're your hosts. I'm Rich, a recovered drug addict. My name is Jerry, and I'm a sober alcoholic. Jerry, why do we do this show? This program is dedicated to people who suffer from the disease of addiction to alcohol and drugs. Also, family members, you suffer greatly. I don't have to tell you that, and I know you have a lot of questions. That's why we're here to answer some of those questions, and hopefully with God's good grace, be able to provide some solutions to this incredible dilemma. All right, just want to pass on some information. If you go to, we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Trudge the Road Radio. You can catch prior episodes up there. We also have a Twitter feed, TTR Show. That's TTR Show, twitter.com, TTR Show. Gotcha. You can catch it on there. And we also have a website, Recovery for Life Channel. Dot com. Coming up, we have a couple of great guests. Uh, we're going to be talking to Marty Ferraro, and uh, Marty is a recovered addict. He is also a uh, treatment He's professional the, here. Marty is the clinical director of adult treatment services at Karen. And also Reverend Jack is going to be joining us in just a little bit. This first segment, we want to talk about two different kinds of drunks, Jerry. Mm-hmm. And and there are. You know, what separates us from the alcoholic from, you know, the, the, the person, the average drinker? Nine out of ten people use alcohol uh, successfully. But to me, it's still just an observation and wonderment. <laughs> and and I'm, I'll give you an example. Uh, on New Year's Eve, uh, I was I was in Myrtle Beach with my daughter and some other people, and I watched them, none of them alcoholics. And I think I mentioned this before, they drank like two glasses of champagne, and uh, they were buzzed. <laughs> you know, they, were, they were really buzzed. And uh, the difference between them and me was that something told them that they're beginning to lose control. They're feeling that they're losing control because of the the alcohol so they stopped you know with an alcoholic and a drug addict just people like you and me it, we're the opposite we feel like we are starting to gain control and that's why we don't stop that's what is so different between us you feel like you're losing control we feel like we're gaining control and that's why and we're bodily and physically you know we are absolutely different uh and i think that if you're an alcoholic out there you'll understand this if we went to the bar we drank four times as much as anybody else there and we were the only ones who were not drunk you know how many times have you heard someone punctuate the sentence with i drive better when i'm drunk Uh, i've said that thousands of times because in your mind you do because you you get that confidence and you you have that feeling of control again like you know what i can drive the fear has been taken away so you can hand that's the difference between an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic now there's two kinds of, of of drinkers there's the acute drinker and the chronic alcoholic and the the acute is is somebody who who drinks and there's a lot of problems in their lives and they cause all kinds of uh, suffering amongst themselves as well as their family members but they are able to disassociate by just detoxing you can detox that person off of alcohol let me give you an example a real good friend of mine who i partied with for years and years fell in love with a beautiful girl and she said you know either the party and stops or i go and he stopped partying and he never did again. It's been 30 years. He just stopped right there. He detoxed off the alcohol and drugs because she was more important. We don't have that wonderful opportunity. Chronic, just the word itself, a Greek word, it means forever. And we are chronic alcoholics. We'll have this disease absolutely forever. A manifestation of an allergy is what the disease is. And the allergy, my allergic reaction to alcohol is a craving for it. That is my allergic reaction to alcohol is a craving for it. And and we, we crave things all the time. You are craving something right now. You're craving air. You don't realize it, but you're craving it. Now, if I were to take a plastic bag and put it over your head, <laughs> right, you'd be craving that air real fast, all right? Now, for folks out there who don't have this disease and can't understand it, maybe now you can a little bit because that's what it's like for us. It's like we can't breathe. There is something going on in my brain that says, if I don't get that drink or that drug, I am going to die. And you feel so much discomfort when you're, when you're feeling that craving. You're sitting, you're, you're restless, you're anxious. You're Irritable and discontent. Exactly. Much like I'd be if you had a plastic bag. Put over my <laughs> yes, head. it would be very irritable, <laughs> very discontent, and anxious, <laughs> terribly anxious. You know, and and that's what we are: restless, irritable, and discontented. Unless uh, we can again experience that ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks. I'm quoting Doctor Silkworth there. I think that uh, that. Uh, 
The Reverend Jack is going to talk a little bit about that and really being Dr. Silkworth's description of a spiritual malady. Restless, irritable, and discontented unless we can again experience that ease and comfort which comes by taking a few drinks. Now, the non-alcoholic may enjoy some ease and comfort by taking a couple of drinks, but it doesn't solve their problems. It does ours. Right. Our problems go away. The non-addicted person, the non-alcoholic's problems are never solved by alcohol. Ours are completely and totally solved. When I'm in my cups, when I'm drunk, I don't have any problems. Yeah, I was the same way. You know, whenever an issue or some sort of a problem arose in my life, the first thing I would think about, you know what, I'll get high, and that way I'm not going to feel anything Mm -hmm. when it comes to this problem. I'm going to deal with it this way by not dealing with it. And that's what gets us to where we are. Now, our road to hell, though, is is not like a ski jump. It's it's a gradual thing. It's progressive, just like the disease. It's progressive. And there's, there's a separation, a separation of... I could describe it as, as loneliness. It's a barrier between you and me that I, I, I just can't seem to, 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 to break unless I have about five shots of, of tequila. And then, by golly, I can, I can feel like you look. Does that make sense? I feel like you look. You look okay. Everything is okay. And I want to be just like that. And those five shots of tequila will provide me that opportunity to feel like you look. And, and that's the disease of addiction. Restless, irritable, and discontent unless we have that ease that's brought on by a few shots of alcohol. The problem with this disease is there's no such thing as a few. It's impossible. Once the gate is open, pow, off to the races, and we're not going to stop until, frankly, it's too late. Let's say you're going to go out to dinner with someone and uh, say you and your your partner are going to go out to dinner with someone. Um, before, what I would do is, you know what, to get ready for this dinner, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a big fat line and then follow <laughs> yeah. it with a couple of beers just so I can get my head right before I go out. Right. And then when I get out there, the first thing I'm going to do at dinner is order some more drinks. And everyone else might have one. I'll have four. And then afterwards, I'm going to have a couple of after dinner drinks. They're going to have one. I'm going to have six. And then we're all going to go home. And of course, remember, I'm fine to drive. I drive better this way. Mm-hmm. I get home and then boom, I'm in the fridge and I'm pounding another 12, 13 beers just because until I can pass out and fall asleep the next day, I wake up and I start all over again. Exactly. You know, and I think that it, you brought up a really good point in, in how we dis- d- disguise our drinking. And that and that was me. If I were going out uh, with another couple uh, for dinner, you know, I would certainly drink like a fish beforehand because, again, I had that incredible constitution that would allow me to be able to consume so much alcohol that the normal person would not even be coherent and I was functioning. All right. Now we would get to the restaurant and, and here now I can it looks like I drink socially. Because maybe I've only had three drinks. The thing is, I've had a half a fifth before I ever got there. And then when we would leave them and the evening would be done and they're gone, bang, there went the rest of that fifth. You know, so it was that disguise, that lie. And the person who was really falling for that lie was me, you know, because I functioned all right in that moment of of conviviality, in that moment of, of sociology. I did okay. And it would just always subtract what happened before, what happened after. And then, as you said, it would start all over again the next day. It's it's like this. It's like getting in the ring with a champion every day and him just beating the heck out of you. And the next day, what do you do? You find yourself crawling back to the ring. You know, this time saying, you know, how am I not going to get beat up today? Right. It's not going to hurt this much right. because, well, I got beat up so bad yesterday. I'm going to step back in there. Go ahead and beat me up a little harder. It, it, exactly. And, 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 as, uh, and, and as Marty is going to say, and, and this is certainly applicable towards me, is that today was the day I was going to stop. Today, no, maybe not today. Now, tomorrow, tomorrow is going to be a perfect day and I'll have all the stars in line and I'll be able to just walk away from this. And, 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 and believe it, absolutely believe it. I think that you probably went through that yourself, that I'm going to be able to stop this tomorrow and life is going to become okay again. And and, and that's the delusion. That's the addiction. That is one of the symptoms of our disease that keeps us in our cups is that tomorrow it's going to get better. Tomorrow it's going to get better. Tomorrow it's going to get better. That tomorrow never gets here. It's today. And that's why we live today one day at a time in the present. On a much simpler uh, level, when you think about it, maybe you smoke cigarettes. How many times have you just bought one pack and thought, you know what, this is going to be my last pack? Sure. I do the same thing. I'll, I'll go to the store. I never buy a carton because no. a carton would make me think that 
that I'm going to continue this process. When I only buy one pack, it makes me think I'm going to quit tomorrow. Well, I wake up in the morning, I have my coffee, and boom, well, maybe not today, but I'll do it tomorrow. Denial. And, yeah. that, and that's a much lower level, but it's it's the same feeling of addiction. It's that same feeling you have when you're a drug addict and you say, tomorrow, I'm, I'm really going to quit this because I'm starting to see some negative consequences. The next day it comes, well, I'm not ready to face that negativity yet, so I'm going to go ahead and do it again today. And it just goes on and it goes on and it goes on. Somewhere along the line, you're going to have to stop and you're going you're going to have to stop, mm -hmm. really. One way or the other. One way or the other. And thank God there are the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to provide you a rational plan of living and behaving so that you can escape this malady and be able to not only live life on life's terms, but begin to enjoy life on life's terms, then begin to appreciate life on life's terms, and then begin to really flourish and become part of life, a very significant and important part of life in the recovering world. Because you're doing that 12 step, you're helping another person, you're working for the family business, doing for God. Because, you know, when, when that, that, that poor drunk or drug addict sometime tonight screams out, God help me, he's going to send you. You know, you're the one who's going to be over there because you are the one who has the solution. And the solution is the 12 steps of AA. And we've got them, we've done them, and we're proud of the fact that they're here and ever so grateful. And what a wonderful impact they've had on, on my life because, you know, we talk about going out to dinner and getting high before we go and getting high while we're there and getting high afterwards. Now I'm focused on the dinner as opposed to focused on all the peripheral stuff you know, like getting high and getting drunk and being able to deal. I just go out to dinner and enjoy what, myself. What were we doing? And, and, you know, in those last couple of years of drinking and using, and if that's where you are right now, it ain't about getting high anymore. It ain't about getting into a party anymore. It's just about trying to buy a minute of, pe minute of peace of mind. That's what we're trying to do. In the last years and years of my using, it was everything just to buy a moment of peace. That's all I wanted. Didn't want to be high, didn't want to be drunk, just didn't want to be a afraid, didn't want to be petrified, didn't want to be shaken in my own skin so bad that I didn't think I could see tomorrow. Reverend Jack is coming up as well as uh, Marty. We talked about Marty just a little bit and it's on Trudge the Road, which by the way is sponsored by Karen Treatment Centers. Karen, a nonprofit leading provider of drug and alcohol addiction treatment. Karen specializes in men's and women's services as well as young adult males and females plus a relapse program and outpatient services. If you're concerned about yourself or a loved one, call 1-800-854-6023 or you can go to their website, karen.org. That's C-A-R-O-N dot org. As I mentioned, Reverend Jack coming up plus Marty. This is Trudge the Road. You're listening to Trudge the Road. Coming up, Reverend Jack joins Jerry and they talk about accepting a power greater than ourselves. It's next on the Trudge the Road Radio Network. There is a new phase of recovery, and you see it in the pages of Renew Magazine and at RenewEveryday.com. Renew and RenewEveryday.com are changing the face of recovery for good. Each issue is filled with positive role models, life-affirming stories, encouragement, and ideas to help any life in recovery. Whether you're already enjoying an addiction-free life, have a loved one facing his challenges, or are considering recovery, Renew and RenewEveryday.com can support and inspire you. Join us. Check out Renew everyday.com to learn more. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Trudge the Road. Trudge the Road sponsored by the Karen Treatment Centers, and Karen is a nonprofit leading provider of drug and alcohol uh, addiction treatment with treatment facilities in Pennsylvania, Florida, and Texas, offices in Bermuda, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and the nation's capital. You can reach them by calling 800-854-6023, or may we suggest you go to the website, which is karen.org, and that's C-A-R-O-N.org. Great people who really will help out in what we know can be a very difficult time. Trudge the Road. Road. Uh, for those of you who maybe come by here for the first time, this is a radio program dedicated to people who suffer from the disease of addiction to alcohol and drugs. And every bit is important, your family and friends. You suffer immensely. And we know that you've got a tremendous amount of questions. We hope to provide some answers and ultimately, with the good grace of God, bring you some solutions to this magnificent dilemma. And speaking of Karen, uh, with us is, is an old friend who trudged the road and uh, a guy we're going to kind of name
him our spiritual advisor, if you will. Please welcome Reverend Jack Abel. Reverend Jack, it's good to have you here, man. Jerry, I'm so excited to be here again. Thanks so much. It, it is. It's just a wonder to be here and to just kind of, you know, pick up on the the energy that's always here on a Sunday morning. You know, it's, it's difficult to be able to articulate on the radio what it is, what we feel around here, but what you provide right here on the campus as you conduct the, uh, the services on Sunday, along with my good friend, Father Bill, uh, it really is a tremendous experience, a very much a spiritual experience. You know, you make me think of a story quick, if I can tell one. Absolutely. We had a patient who was struggling, and this campus is so beautiful. If you've never been here, you don't sort of realize it, but it was a day like today, a gorgeous sunny day, and I took the patient on a walk, and we were sitting on a bench looking out at the valley, and I said, you know, if you look out there, are you sure you really don't believe in anything? And she said, well, I can see what you're saying, that 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 all that beauty has to have been sort of somehow shows some sort of revelation or design or whatever. And, and I said, but I see one other thing. And she said, what? And I said, you're a part of that picture. And you could see the like change hit her. Because all of myself. a sudden <laughs> she realized that like, wow, I, I guess I'm a part of this universe too. But that's one of those things that the beauty of the natural world will heal if you're open to it just in itself, you know, like how gorgeous a place will be if you tune into it and then realize that you're a part of it. Um, I, I, I'll never forget that moment. It was a great moment. That is. Thank you for sharing that. As a matter of fact, Rich, when he comes back, he was just down uh, at the Outer Banks. He, he brought me some photographs of some sunrises that he took on the beach. And, and his comment, and it's very true, as you look at this incredible picture that an artist has yet to ever capture uh, to say, you know, to tell me there's no God. I, it's just it's just amazing to see him to be able to experience that and to be able to be free enough to do so because as we know prisoners in our own soul because of this disease we missed all of that absolutely you know you were talking to me and i think it's a very important about recovery as as an epic undertaking as as a, as a journey and, uh, and 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 it certainly is and it's got its ups and downs it's got its roads but i think that that aspect of looking at it that way as as a journey uh, an epic journey of epic proportion is is excellent i'd like you to comment on that well i think it's so interesting i have a lot of young people in my life these days we work with young people at karen and i have some young people in my friends and family circle and they really like that word now they say epic you know <laughs> but I, I, I'm around people all the time who are awakening to a quest, you know, that, that really uh, asks of them a huge amount of courage and fear. It takes them across a threshold into a universe they have never really experienced. They have no idea what they're in store for. And then they have to, you know, slay dragons and acquire helpful tools and find themselves, you know, like along it's really almost like a Wizard of Oz or Star Wars or Raiders of the Lost Ark thing to get clean and sober. And so every time I hear that epic word, you know, tossed around, I'm thinking, I, I get to watch that. That's what, and that's what recovery really is about. It's, it's an extraordinary call and an arduous undertaking and uh, a, a battling demons kind of thing. And it, and it delivers you ultimately into an entirely new life. It's, it's, it's an epic journey. I feel like Indiana Jones, man. <laughs> right. dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and, you know, the only fear about that that I have in bringing it to people that way is to make sure that people also realize, though, it's not a call to grandiosity. It's a call. It's an epic journey towards humility and towards love, and towards self-sacrifice. So it's, it, I can sell it as soon as I say, oh, it's like great, and it's an adventure, and all that sort of stuff. And then when I tell people, and you're going to give up everything you own, and <laughs> like lose your life, and uh, you know, uh, but, but, but find love, then people may have to like take a breath back and realize, really? Like, and, and have to ask themselves, do I really have what it takes to undertake a journey like that. That's what I think it's a great way of talking about the journey of recovery. Though. I think it's fantastic. I think it's amazing. But, you know, when you look at all of, of the superheroes, uh, they all had a sense of humility, you know? Superman had a sense of humility. And and, and I, I, I believe and I agree with you that people who do this journey and who stay on this epic road of recovery are superheroes. It absolutely is to me. You know, even while we're recording right now, one of the things that we do on Sunday mornings at Karen is we get together as a community, but with alumni and family and friends and people come down and receive coins for periods of time and sobriety. And I always think of it like a hero's walk, you know, like here this person comes down and everybody's clapping and cheering and, and, it, and, and, it's because it's miraculous and extraordinary and courageous and arduous. Like people have really 
um, gone through the ringer to get um, those milestones. And one day it may be one month or three months or four months that we're celebrating with one person. And then the next person will come down and there is 43 years, 43 years of this uh, wandering in the wilderness of sobriety <laughs> and coming to find out, you know, where you are and who you are and, and, and how to love. And, and that's, I have to ask you is, yeah, dealing with people like we do on a spiritual basis, how do you get someone, and I'll use myself as, as an example, to take action on principles they either don't believe in or are afraid to believe in? In other words, you know, I spent years trying to just stay sober within the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, you know, that meant continual fa- uh, failure. And, and and it wasn't until, you know, somebody uh, through desperation uh, gave me the gift of spirituality. But you, as a cleric and as a, as a counselor and somebody who deals with this, what are the tools that you use to get people to take action on principles that maybe they're afraid of or that they don't believe in? You know, I love the question, and I think my answer is, um, you know, that there's no simple way of making people awaken to it, but the literature even tells us when we stop using our drug of choice, the next likely stopping point after perhaps a little bit of exuberance is, mm-hmm. is restless, irritable, and discontented. I'm, I'm going to struggle without my drugs because they were how I lived and survived. And so all of a sudden, you've taken the bottle away from the baby. No disrespect to those of you who are in recovery, but you right, know right. that's how we react. Wah, wah, oh, yeah. wah. <laughs> yes, and do. so if you can help people through the same tool, I think we teach the tool. So I say, well, you're just as powerlessness you're experiencing powerlessness and unmanageability now over your mood and your attitude. Your your life is out of control, even without drugs and alcohol. And you still have needs. And, and uh, you know, that's one of the great things when you really are actively in a recovery program with people who are doing what they're supposed to do. People will call you on your stuff and help you see that even though you're not drinking, you're maybe acting out sexually or you're sure. all of a sudden overeating or, oh, my gosh, you know, like I'm on my way to the casino. Mm-hmm. Uh, really? <laughs> you know, and and people are starting to uh, if you're if you're plugged in and you're not just around a program, but in the program and you have a sponsor or other stuff, you start realizing I not only need to stop using I need to change everything. Everything, you know. It's it's remarkable that uh, that you brought up what uh, what you did because it was a, really it's a quote from Doctor Silkworth, uh, Silkworth, and I believe that really it was his description of the spiritual malady: restless, irritable, and discontented. Unless we can again experience that ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks, I think that is the spiritual malady. It is, and you know that makes me think of the correspondence between Bill Wilson and Carl Jung. Mm-hmm in the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous, where Carl Jung, the great pioneer of psychoanalysis, along with his colleague Sigmund Freud, and they used to fight about the spirituality component of psychic healing. Exactly. Thank you, Dr. Jung. (laughs) Right. Oh, my God. We would be in a mess without his influence on Alcoholics Anonymous. But he said that it was interesting that alcohol was called spirits. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, that may have been a clue to the fact that people reach for the drink because they have a spiritual problem. And that the project of recovery could, in fact, be framed as spirit versus spirits. Mm-hmm. And, and that spiritual problem manifests as soon as we take away the spirits we were using, right? We get, we, get, we get back in trouble. We're in difficulty. We're in hardship. We're in fear. We're in all those things. And, and the temptations and cravings and impulses that come on a person at some stage in recovery when they're in crisis. I was going to say an early recovery, but it, you know, it can mm-hmm. happen at 10 years sober. Absolutely. You can get restless, irritable, and discontented. And that's a spiritual symptom. That's a symptom of a need that you're either going to fill with, an, uh, with a bottle of mm-hmm. some sort with a dependency solution that doesn't work, or you're going to fill with something that really does. Exactly. The patience aspect, you know, suffering from this disease of I want what I want when I want it, you know, and, and that was I want this spiritual experience and I want it right now. And, and the reality was that it was happening and I just couldn't recognize it. What do you do to get people to recognize the fact that this is a this 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 element of uh, of God is occurring in their life right now until they feel that, if you will, pink cloud? This is, again, it's like to me the 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 effect of being around other people. People think, well, I'm going to get the book or I'm going to watch an episode of a television show and I'm going to know how to get sober. And what they need to do is be around other people who can help them see what's going on. Like, and um, I would I would miss the things. We talked about nature. And I, I remember when I was first in early recovery and I was walking along the beach and I, there was this one scene, it's hysterical. I was asking for a higher power to show up in my life 
and it was kind of a cloudy day, and the clouds parted on this beautiful lighthouse, and there were dolphins playing in the surf, and it was, I mean, it was extraordinary, and I went, <gasps> like that, and then the clouds like closed up, and I thought, nah. <laughs> you know, like... I, like The Doubting Thomas. Uh, it's astounding yeah. to me that, and but when if, <laughs> but if other people are around there to hear me tell that story, or to see it with me, and then they say, oh no, hey, wait, don't give up on that, because... These in-breaking moments of grace or mercy or beauty or love or redemption are what it's all about. Then I learn to I, to acquire the habit of seeing and believing. I'm accompanied on the journey, and, and, and it's very true. And I, as much as you know, I'm the slowest learner there is in recovery. You know, and I was around a long time before I was able to allow myself to experience a spiritual experience. The things that were happening to me, those acts of nature specifically, acts of family, being with uh, with family, and, and having those those true moments of uh, uh, of, of nonverbal communication that are just uh, spoken out so loud. You know what I'm talking about. That I don't think it's necessarily reserved for us, but I think it's very special for those of us who are in recovery, and I think absolutely part of the spiritual miracle that occurs in our life on a daily basis. You know, again, to circle back to that epic journey, one of the things that's so interesting in all those great stories of epics is that the heroes get typically some sort of supernatural aid, and maybe an angel or a, 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 a wicked witch or even, I mean, a good witch of the north or whatever that comes in and provides help and assistance. And so you're right. It's not just addicts who need this assistance, but as addicts seeking recovery, we absolutely need help from something greater than ourselves. Absolutely. And I think, you know, join me if you will on this or not. I really started to suffer from alcoholism when I stopped drinking. <laughs> you know, that's when it all hit. I was so surprised by that. I was so surprised that my recovery after a little bit of exuberance was so difficult. And I, I just didn't, I, I kind of thought if I can actually put away the drink and the drugs, I may be like miserable and bored, but, I'll, but I'm going to be better. And in fact, I was excited, but worse. Right. You know, right. it was oddly a, the inverse of everything that I thought it was going to be. And then that spiritual thing starts to happen and everything begins to turn around. And life on life's terms becomes really quite enjoyable most of the time. It is an amazing thing to be a person on the recovery journey. And, you know, I love the humor of Bill Wilson in that closing line on the 164th page where he says, trudge the road of happy destiny. <laughs> it, it's not all easy. No, it's not no. easy street. We have to sort of work diligently in our path and there are going to be obstacles and times. And but it is a road of happy destiny. There is so much joy, so much love, so much peace. And that's one of those things I think when you're in the dark place and you don't know what recovery is about, that, that you can't even imagine what the love is going to be like, what that happiness and freedom is going to be. We have to end on that note. You are the best. Epic adventure and journey. I'm going to quote you on that one too, if you don't mind. That's Reverend Jack. We're live at Karen on Trudge the Road. Trudge the Road is brought to you by Karen Treatment Centers, a nonprofit leading provider of drug and alcohol addiction treatment, specializing in men's and women's services, as well as young adult males and females. There's a relapse program. There's outpatient services. Listen, if you're concerned about yourself, if you're concerned about a loved one, call this number. 800-854-6023. Better yet, go to the website, learn out a little bit more about Reverend Jack here. It's karen.org. That's C-A-R-O-N.org. Reverend Jack, we'll see you again here really soon. Thank you so much for, for stopping by, man. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jerry. Great to see you. Great to see you. This is Trudge the Road on the Trudge the Road Radio Network. You're listening to Trudge the Road. Coming up, Marty Ferrero joins Jerry and tells his story and how he came to find sobriety through treatment at the 12 Steps. It's next on the Trudge the Road Radio Network. There is a new phase of recovery, and you see it in the pages of Renew Magazine and at RenewEveryday.com. Renew and RenewEveryday.com are changing the face of recovery for good. Each issue is filled with positive role models, life-affirming stories, encouragement, and ideas to help any life in recovery. Whether you're already enjoying an addiction-free life, have a loved one facing his challenges, or are considering recovery, Renew and RenewEveryday.com can support and inspire you. Join us. Check out Renew everyday.com to learn more. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Trudge the Road. Trudge the Road is a radio program which is dedicated to people who suffer from the disease of addiction to alcohol and to drugs. And every bit is important. Family and friends, you suffer greatly. We know that. We know you have a lot of questions. We hope to bring you some answers here. And hopefully, with God's good grace, 
a solution to this dilemma. And we're very excited about the fact and proud to tell you that Trudge the Road is brought to you by the Karen Treatment Centers. Karen is a nonprofit leading provider of drug and alcohol addiction treatment with treatment facilities in Pennsylvania, Florida, and Texas, in offices in Bermuda, Boston, the Big Apple, Philly, and Washington, D.C. You can reach them by calling 800 854 6023. May I suggest go to the website? It's wonderful. It's Karen.org, and that's spelled C A R O N. Dot org. And with this is Marty Ferrero. Marty is the uh, the clinical director of adult services at Karen. And before we get to all of that neat stuff and what you do at the treatment facility, we thought we'd get to know you just a little bit better. And and you come to us via Massachusetts, I understand. Well, yeah, it's great to be here, Jerry. Thanks. Um, I actually was born and raised in Massachusetts, uh, but actually come here via uh, almost full circle around this uh, great country of ours uh, as a direct result of uh, my disease of addiction and my recovery. Recovery. Terrific. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, uh, like I said, being originally from Massachusetts, uh, when I was uh, 30 years old, my friends and family, actually my friends did the one thing I asked them, whatever you do, don't call my family. And uh, thank God they did when they did, <laughs> yeah. uh, because uh, I was r- literally hanging by a thread at that point. I was, uh, I'm, I'm 6'3", I was 160 pounds. I was, uh, you could see every rib showing. I was really withering away to nothing physically, uh, spiritually. Uh, this disease had me. Well, more, fair to say more dead than alive at this point. Yes, that would be an accurate statement. And uh, I really had been trying uh, for about a year on my own uh, with every fiber of my being on a daily basis. I, I didn't want to be doing what I was doing. I was quitting drinking and quitting freebase and cocaine every single day. And I really meant that. And then literally every single night I was back at it because I, I knew that this was going to be it, that I was letting this go. And if I was, which I was, then uh, I needed to get some more because this was it and I was done. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've ridden the same, uh, same bike. <laughs> you know, and, and, and you know, see if you agree with me or not. I, that morning when you got up in the morning and swore that you would never, ever do this again, if they put you on the best lie detector machine the FBI has, it had come out the truth. Absolutely. I mean, I really did. I was sincere and I meant it. I didn't know that, um, you know, uh, almost a whole year would go by with me doing that on a daily basis because it really felt like today was the day and I was going to do this. Um, But what I learned was that left to my own devices, this disease was way more powerful than just me alone. And I, I couldn't do it. So I imagine it took you down a pretty scary road. Yeah, the empty, aching, lonely place that I got to, I mean, I hope I never experienced that again, obviously, but um, I really, uh, like I said, my friends finally made the call. I didn't let a lot of people see me in that condition right. uh, because it was really a pathetic state. Um, and it was far from the, you know, social uh, kind of, you know, happy times, if you will, uh, way back when. And uh, this was really just something I couldn't not not do. And uh, just to try to make it through another day and and uh, and hopefully, you know, put this behind me and, and left to my own devices. It was it was way bigger than me. And I, I didn't know that. I thought I could I was still confident I could somehow pull this off and and nobody would know. And, and everybody knew something was not right uh, with me. So by the time that occurred, um, I went out to Minnesota for treatment for what I thought would be 28 days. And uh, that turned into 14 years. So I was out there. <laughs> now, was it just the longest treatment in the world or <laughs> or did, did something else pop up out of it? Actually, uh, you know, it was a month of primary treatment. And and what happened about halfway through was uh, two things. One of my best friends who had been through it before me, a friend from college, who, you know, we had gone to a couple hundred dead shows together and, and you know, I really trusted him and he was like a brother to me and he was two and a half years sober and he, he picked me up at the airport, brought me up to treatment uh, and he would come visit every Sunday and he pulled a calendar off my desk, flipped four months down the road and he said, and here's your release date from uh, from Fellowship Club. And I'm like, Fellowship Club, what is <laughs> <What's> this? that? <laughs> and uh, he told me it was a halfway house in St. Paul, Minnesota, and that's where I'd be going following treatment. And I, I said, well, whoa, wait a minute. I have a whole house at home. Thank you very much. And uh, I, the, the term itself just scared the heck out of me because I had this stereotypical image of a rundown building with wine I was out front and I, I didn't want any part of that. And what happened was my counselor also on the heels of that made a recommendation to me as well. And that was four months at fellowship club. And, and in the spirit of open-mindedness and willingness, I went down and took a look at it. And what I found was it was not a rundown building. It was actually quite nice facility. And, um, you know, there were other people just like me that 
when I, when I was honest with myself, I had been using since the age of 13, drinking, smoking pot, and uh, using one thing or another for the past 16 years. And I had been sober about 16 days. And I was pretty much, you know, frazzled in a fog. And I trusted uh, my friend and I trusted my counselor that they had my best interests in mind. And I have to say, looking back, the structure and support that I had in going through those ups and downs in those first, you know, the four months I was there really had everything, has everything to do with why I'm still sober today. Uh, I don't think I would be uh, sober nonstop consecutively since that time. And that was 19 and uh, and a half years ago. Um, But it really provided me with, um, you know, being surrounded by uh, other addicts and alcoholics who were doing the deal like I was and who were able to give me feedback that all the love and support in the world of my family, I don't think they could have done that for me because quite honestly, the first two of those four months, I was self-will run riot, although I didn't think so. And that's what it says <laughs> yeah. in the big book that it, alcoholics are extreme examples of self-will run riot, although we usually don't think so. And the reason being for that is that, uh, you know, I had agreed to initially go out there for a month, and now here I was making this four, it seemed like eternity, but four month commitment. I was still sober. What do you want from me? All these rules and regulations, and I didn't quite connect all the dots as to what, why was this so important? What does this have to do with me staying sober? And, uh, you know, really, truly, I wasn't struggling with wanting to pick up a drink or a drug, but I was on that path that, that left unchecked. It would have led to getting high again or drinking again. And instead, I had to take a look at the feedback that I received, you know, from my small, my group of guys in my group, 10, 10 guys, and know that I knew they weren't lying to me. And uh, I, my feelings were hurt. I got defensive. I was angry, but I really had to take a look at it. And, uh, and I realized, wow, you know, they're right. And I, I had to make some changes. And as a result of that, the second two months, it was like night and day. You know, I, I really, truly at that point surrendered and uh, turned it over uh, followed all the rules, did, stopped fighting. It, it felt like you know going from swimming upstream against the current by myself to just going with the flow, and going with everybody, and uh, you know became president of the house. I mean, it was it was a total turnaround, um, and you know really has a lot to do, like I said, with why I'm still sober now. And, and I don't think that you know maybe a lot of folks don't understand that type of a change in us people who suffer from the disease of addiction is dramatic. It's an incredible change. Uh, we will do anything in our power, and we've proven that over a number of years, not to make those changes. But what you have just related to us, and I think is very significant, was matter really a simple decision was made, and everything changed. Right, because what happened, um, you know, without going boring you with all the details, but I my resistance to the whole God thing initially, having lost both my parents when I was very young. I, you know, for like the 25 years before I got to treatment, and I'd never been exposed to these 12 steps. I had a huge resistance because I thought, you know, if there is a God, what a jerk. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I lost both my parents and I was raised by my grandparents who were wonderful, but you know, obviously it was pretty, pretty uh, traumatic early on. And probably one of the key factors that allowed me to find out that I'm chemically dependent. And, uh, and so um, I had thought that I had turned it over and that it was in God's hands. And then I went down to that halfway house and really took my will back completely, but didn't, didn't know it. And so I learned the hard way at that point that it's not a one-time thing. This is a daily deal in terms of the surrender and turning it over multiple times a day uh, if necessary. And really, um, you know, putting things in God's hands. So when I was first exposed to the 12 steps, uh, the notion of being powerless, I knew that because of having, you know, quit every day for a year leading up to it. I didn't have any qualms with that. My life was completely unmanageable. But then when I looked at two through 12 and the solution, and I saw God here and higher power, and, and you know, it's obviously a spiritual program, uh, I had some real uh, resistance to that, uh, to put it mildly. And it was really through the three essentials that I overcame that was honesty, open mindedness, and willingness that allowed me to, and I, and I quickly realized that I don't have to believe anything that anybody else uh, tells me I have to, that really these are suggestions and that the beauty of it is it's the God of my understanding and ultimately the God of my experience. Which today has to be magnificent. It's pretty incredible, uh, I have to say. You talked about the the, the structure uh, and support that you received, and sometimes I think we refer to that of lately of connectedness. That's actually what I've learned around here and how important that is and that structure and that support, not just, again, then from the, the living environment you're in, but as you process through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous or basically for those who don't suffer from this disease are given a, an outline to live, a, a blueprint for living, correct? 
And that's really, you know, you just hit it on the head. That's really what it is. The steps two through 12 in the solution are, you know, a way of life that really anybody could benefit from, whether you're chemically dependent or not. Um, they're really based on universal principles and, uh, and they work. And AA didn't make up these principles in the 1930s. Um, we were able to, you know, AA was able to put them together in such a way to allow for a spiritual transformation to take place if you really work them and apply them. And, and none of us are perfect. I mean, it talks about spiritual progress, not spiritual perfection in the big book. And, and I can tell you that, you know, having gone through the experience that I was just describing um, in the, in very early on in the process, and, you know, they say it's a real simple program, all you have to do is change everything, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And so I literally ended up staying out in Minnesota uh, and, and you know, being in that recovering community. There was an article in Newsweek at the time called Minnesota, and, uh, you know, coffee shops everywhere with just Recovery Central. And so I, I stuck around because I knew I was onto something really good. I had no idea, you know, where it would take me or how long I'd be there. But uh, about eight years into my recovery, I ended up moving out of St. Paul, 45 miles north, little town in, just over the border in Wisconsin, beautiful country setting, uh, but and, and to be closer to work where I was working at a treatment center. And as a result, I was much more disconnected from what you just described. I, you know, I had a sponsor, but I wasn't really working with him. I, uh, had, I was down to like one meeting a week. And I don't ever want to hang my hat on the fact that I work in this industry and in this field because I've seen some people fall pretty hard. Who, yes, I have too. Yeah, yeah. Who feel like oh, I'm surrounded by these twelve steps all day long. Well, that's that's my my you know vocation, um, but working my own program of recovery, um, I was uh, I intervened upon again. Now, I was still I was sober. Um, I wasn't struggling with wanting to pick up a drink or a drug, but uh, we had started this little men's group and I had a couple guys there really uh, concerned about me at the time, isolating more. And and uh, I thought, you know, one of them was was talking about himself. He was concerned about whatever. And then he, he said, no, I'm, I'm concerned about you. <laughs> and uh, and so at the time, what I did, I took, uh, took some time off from work and I actually made it out here to what is now called the Breakthrough Program. Right. In 2001, I spent a week and that was an unbelievable experience, a life-changing experience as well. It just speaks to, you know, wanting to grow and learn along the way. Um, we never fully arrive, you know, with these 12 steps. They're cyclical and, you know, hopefully I'll always continue to be uh, growing and learning and, and letting this unfold and getting out of my own way. And it was a direct result of being open to the feedback I received and taking some action. That um, rational plan for, uh, for legitimate behavior. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. And we, we, we've got, we're kind of running out of time here. We want to find out more about what you do with Karen, but a remarkable story. And, uh, and we certainly have to have you back. And, and we'll talk more, too, about the big book. I understand that you and I share that love. That passion. That absolutely. Passion. Absolutely. Terrific. Marty, thank you very much. We'll be back with Marty and talk a little bit more about what he does as the clinical uh, director for adult services at Karen. Karen, who, by the way, sponsors this program, Trudge Road. If you don't know this, Karen is a nonprofit leading provider of drug and alcohol addiction treatment. They specialize in men's and women's services, as well as young adult males and females, plus a relapse program and outpatient services. If you are concerned about yourself or a loved one, call 800-854-6023 or go to the website, which is karen.org. That's C-A-R-O-N.org. And we'll find out more specifically about some of that treatment when we come back with Marty. This is Trudge the Road on the Trudge the Road radio network. You're listening to Trudge the Road. Coming up, part two of Jerry's interview with Marty. It's next on the Trudge the Road radio network. There is a new face of recovery, and you see it in the pages of Renew Magazine and at RenewEveryday.com. Renew and RenewEveryday.com are changing the face of recovery for good. Each issue is filled with positive role models, life-affirming stories, encouragement, and ideas to help any life in recovery. Whether you're already enjoying an addiction-free life, have a loved one facing his challenges, or are considering recovery, Renew and RenewEveryday.com can support and inspire you. Join us. Check out Renew everyday.com to learn more. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Trudge the Road. My name is Jerry. I'm a sober alcoholic, and Trudge the Road is a radio program dedicated to people who suffer from the disease that I do, addiction. Addiction to drugs and alcohol. And our family and friends, we know how you suffer. You've got a lot of questions. We hope to have some answers. And ultimately, 
with God's grace, provide you some solutions to this magnificent dilemma. We're very proud to announce that Treads the Road is sponsored by the Karen Treatment Centers, a nonprofit leading provider of drug and alcohol addiction treatment. They've got treatment facilities in Pennsylvania, also in Florida and Texas, offices in Bermuda, Boston, New York, Philly, and D.C. You can reach them by calling 800-854-6023. Go to their website, caron.org. That's Karen. Dot org, and I know you're going to find some some wonderful uh, information there. Marty Ferraro is is with us, and thank you, Marty, for sharing part of your story with us too. And, and we'll have to get more into that. It's just absolutely fascinating. You made quite a trip. If we could just kind of pick up here, we, we, we left you off in uh, in Minnesota, working at a treatment center, eight years sober, and you just had this kind of you know change, if you would, you climbed another mountain in your sobriety. Just kind of pick us up where you are there right now, so we can get back home. Sure. Um, you know, at that point, um, as I had mentioned, I came out here, spent a week at what is now the Breakthrough Program uh, here at Karen, actually. And it was, you know, this uh, experiential psychodrama kind of work that I had never uh, been exposed to. And it was uh, it was an incredible experience. And it's something that's available to five and a half day programs to put a little plug in. But really, truly, uh, for you know, people in recovery and and don't even have to be in recovery, but just kind of stuck in your life emotionally, spiritually, and it was uh, it was a life changing event for me. Um, and went back and just uh, was so rejuvenated, refreshed. Um, I'd a- also spent a week at um, High Watch Farm mm-hmm. in Kent, Connecticut. Um, that's a that's another whole story in a place that Bill Wilson uh, visited. I believe it was in the fall of 1939 with Marty Mann, and. Um, you know, he described it uh, going through the the old White House there, walking through that doorway that he could you could cut the spirituality with a knife. It was so thick there, and and I experienced that too. Um, so it was just what the doctor ordered, if you will, at the time, and something that really recharged my spiritual batteries. That whole experience, taking some time out from my work in this field, which is uh, you know burnout is a huge factor for, <laughs> yeah. for those of us. Been there, done that, burned out more than once. <laughs> yeah, right, and yeah. Uh, and so really, you know, we're we're big proponents of self care around here, and and really truly uh, working our own program of recovery, um, so that we have something to give, you know, to our patients and and help point them in the right direction. So for me, at that time, um, you know, I, I like I said, I spent 14 years in Minnesota, and an opportunity had come up at the time for. Uh, the treatment center I was working at where they had acquired a facility out on the West Coast in Oregon. And um, and so I was uh, offered an opportunity to head out that way and uh, run uh, their men's program out there for uh, what turned out to be a couple of years because um, I ended up taking another opportunity in New Mexico. Um, and a- up until that point, you know, I had been treated at that treatment center. I had been trained at that treatment center. And all I had known was that treatment center in terms of working in the field. And I had colleagues who had left and gone on to other uh, experiences, other places. So <laughs> I finally decided to take that plunge. And it was sort of like leaving the nest, if you will. Um, you know, and this was a number of years into my recovery. But um, professionally, I'm really grateful that I did. Um, in, in Taos, New Mexico is an incredible place. It's it the is. southern tip of the Rocky Mountains. It's, uh, you know, just very spiritual, thriving, recovering community. Um, the outfit that I was with was undergoing lots of different changes, and, and that's a whole other story. But uh, what happened was, um, you know, I was there for a couple of years, was married there, uh, had my now, uh, my daughter will be three in November, and that's uh, just a miracle in itself and, and the beauty of my life. And, um, and then I was presented with this opportunity. And so none of this I had planned out, you know, 19 and a half years ago um, when I went out to treatment that, you know, recovery would just take me literally around this country, almost full circle. Uh, but more importantly, you know, from a spiritual standpoint, being rocketed into that fourth dimension that Big go. Book talks about. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, to give us everybody a little bit of an idea of, of where Karen is located, it's in Wernersville, Pennsylvania, really not too far outside of Philadelphia. So right. geographically, you kind of know know where we are, and uh, and if you've done any of your research and got on the website, or uh, are you familiar with recovery, you already know that this is uh, one of the world's leading treatment centers, and you certainly have a big job in front of you as clinical director of adult services. Now, you just give kind of the four one one on what that entails. Well, basically, uh, among many things that I get to do around here, and it's a real I, I look at it as a God job, if you will, and it's a real blessing to work with so many talented people on so many different levels. Um, So basically what I do is I supervise the clinical supervisors of all the adult units, both primary uh, men's and women's units, the relapse unit, which is our only co-ed unit, uh, our extended care programs, uh, both for men and women. And uh, so I get to 
really work with as a team, the supervisors of those units, but I also have lots of opportunities along the way uh, to stay connected clinically, if you will, where I'm invited in on some difficult, say, family sessions, uh, any given time that uh, counselors may uh, want a little assistance with or facilitate some group therapy sessions, co-facilitate. Um, so not often, but enough that it really uh, helps to keep my clinical skills sharp and, and stay connected in that way. But then on the other hand, uh, involved in lots of different projects and uh, you know, always trying to raise the bar in terms of what we offer and, and our uh, treatment services and uh, the quality of the care that we provide. So we, we stay really open to, um, you know, learning and growing all the time and not professing to be, you know, the end all be all that, that we don't have anything to learn because we, we feel like we offer uh, an incredible program, but we also want to continue to improve upon that um, and stay true to the vision and the mission that Dick and Catherine Karen started, you know, over 50 years ago, which, you know, our CEO, Doug Tiemann talks about that institutional memory, if you will, that goes literally back to Dick, Karen, and uh, that spirituality and that love that that's literally the fabric uh, kind of uh, on this campus that people feel when they when they come here. And I think that, you know, the tangibility of that is, is Rich and I have uh, been blessed to be here on many occasions. And we were here not too long ago uh, for one of the alumni events. And there were a lot of alumni here. And each one of them who came up and chatted with us about this uh, this program talked about uh, the sense of spirit that they get returning here, as if that that there is something very special here, something that is that is almost tangible amongst this environment. And of course, this is a very very beautiful place, and the, the scenery is gorgeous, and it's in a lovely area. Yeah, and we're elevated up here too, so it's it's sort of uh, you know referred to as Magic Mountain, if you will, uh, because it really there's some miracles that happen around here, and it's just incredible. And you, you're probably referring to the annual reunion that we have uh, every summer, right. where people just come from thousands of miles around, and we have this campus just full of alumni and, and so much gratitude, and, and uh, you know, it's a really neat event. Um, and every year I run into uh, people who are former patients here, alumni, who, you know, if you were a betting person, you probably think, wow, this guy, or this gal is never, never going to make it, um, you know, as a patient. But we, you know, try to instill some hope. We try to stack the deck in their favor. We really put together, a, you know, for every patient, a continuing care plan and follow them for 12 months out. Do everything we can to help them uh, succeed on this very difficult, what can be at times difficult path. And to run into some of them at the reunion, smiling back with their families, um, you know, I, I'm practically in tears when I, when it's, it happens every year, you know, it's, it's an incredible uh, thing to be a part of. It's, I think it's that, that connectedness that, that, you know, we, we feel around here that, that spiritual strength, that support, that level that is just a, that is a foundation to all our recoveries coming home, if you will. Yeah. Because really, truly, I mean, I, people here live it, breathe it. And, uh, you know, we're, it's not just lip service. I mean, we try to be walking examples on a daily basis of, uh, the gifts of this program has to offer and uh, show people, not just tell them, but to de demonstrate it on a daily basis. What um, you know, what recovery has to offer, and um, and so yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a pretty incredible thing. Well, you're working for the family business, man. You know that's that's really who you're working for is God. You know, and and that that one day, I'm sure that when you said, you know, whatever your will is in my life, let it be done. Bang, here it happened, and this is a for you, I'm sure, just a beautiful experience. Yeah, and it's you know, you mentioned the family business. That's where I was at prior to being intervened upon, and and that family business back in Massachusetts is running much better without me. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> but, but I hear you. And it's, uh, yeah, it's this place um, I can't even describe. It's just I look forward to coming to work every day. And, you know, people uh, come through and, and really struggle. And what I tell them as patients is that, you know, pain is the touchstone of all spiritual progress. And so a lot of times they think, oh, I was doing so well until, and then there was this sort of setback because of their roommate or something went on at home or what have you. And really that's where the growth happens, you know, not when everything is going smoothly, but when they're, uh, when they're struggling. Well, the obstacles that, uh, that present themselves, and, and they certainly do. It, it, that connectedness, the continuing uh, care that you give people, the, uh, the, the sense of spirit that's very tangible to us around here, it's just wonderful to be here. We compliment you, the entire staff in this wonderful facility, and of course, thank you for sponsoring Trudge Road.
Oh, it's our pleasure. Thanks for having me. Marty, we got to have you back, man. You're the best. We really do appreciate that. You can find out more about Marty. You can find out more about Karen, who sponsors Trudge the Road, by going to their website, which is karen.org. That's C-A-R-O-N dot org. And they sponsor Trudge the Road. They are a nonprofit leading provider of drug and alcohol addiction treatment. They're the best, and we appreciate that. Back with more of Trudge Road shortly. This is the Trudge the Road Radio Network. You've been listening to Trudge the Road. If you would like to hear past episodes of the program, go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Trudge the Road Radio. And join us next week as former Miss USA Tara Connor joins us on the Trudge the Road Radio Network. There is a new phase of recovery, and you see it in the pages of Renew Magazine and at RenewEveryday.com. Renew and RenewEveryday.com are changing the face of recovery for good. Each issue is filled with positive role models, life-affirming stories, encouragement, and ideas to help any life in recovery. Whether you're already enjoying an addiction-free life, have a loved one facing his challenges, or are considering recovery, Renew and RenewEveryday.com can support and inspire you. Join us. Check out Renew. Renew everyday.com to learn more.